Oh, wait, where'd Jeff go? <laughs> That's weird. Yeah, it's like well, all of a sudden I got kicked out of the room or something. Wasn't me. <laughs> I don't want that responsibility. Oh, I got you. I got you. Well, everybody, today uh, we have a special Ask, Ask the Expert panel, and uh, we have a few guests. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, myself. I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. We have Matt Enderly from Patch Praise, Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios, and Puff. 3dpuffpro.com. Yep. We have Eric Campbell from, well, everywhere, the take up. Producer, two regular guys. Uh, we'll think about some of the others. And brilliance, there we go. And we have DJ Anderson, uh, educator himself from digitizingmasterclass.com. And you used to work for Floriani, right? Yeah, I did for about 13 years. Okay, awesome. Well, um, let's go ahead. We'll have uh, DJ if you want to give us a quick like bio. Okay. Well, um, I've been in the industry. I don't know about going on about twenty years now. Um, got started um, in the commercial um, contract work, so um, I did nothing but contract embroidery, running two to three shifts a day. Um, did a lot for. It was in Houston, Texas, so there was a lot of embroidery there. And so I kind of specialized in the custom work. So like things like advanced applique type stuff. I mean, there were so many different things that, that I did that a lot of companies didn't want to do. And um, so it, that's kind of how I got started. Um, owned that business for a few years and sold it and went to work for R&K Distributing, which is... Um, the, the Floriani brand is under that. And I was fortunate enough, um, I got mentored by Walter Floriani. So I got to work side by side with him for 10 years and um, learned an amazing amount about everything. Um, the digitizing, I mean, I, I can't say enough about his knowledge. And um, I was very lucky to be able to sit side by side with him and just learn from him. And together we built the Floriani software. I kind of took everything that was in his head and worked with the programmers and created the software. And um, and I love that. Software is like kind of a passion of mine. So, um, and I also learned a lot about stabilizers at that point. I didn't really know much about it. And that was something that um, really opened my eyes um just how much of a difference it makes if you can choose the right stabilizer and um, not just for the product when you do it but after it's laundered so there's a lot that people can learn about stabilizers and how it can really help their um, project and the the overall outcome of their embroidery so i got to go to all the mills where they're manufactured um, I learned from the guru of stabilizers. Um, her name was Kay Brooks. She's the reason why stabilizers are actually made for this industry. They used to be adopted from other stuff, but she tweaked all those formulas. And that's why our stabilizers are way better today than they were 20 years ago. So anyways, awesome. sorry, too much. Very cool. I teach digitizing and uh, software. So Very cool. All right, Eric, your turn. Uh, similar kind of upbringing, I guess you want to say it that way. Uh, like 20 plus years in the industry, starting out commercial business to business. So as an operator, started out kind of in school, operating on the side, working at a place, I mean, hucking around boxes of t-shirts and then eventually becoming a machine operator, running uh, 12 head machines, multiple 12 head machines, uh, unfortunately, sometimes. But uh, <laughs> lots of business to business work, lots of commercial work. Uh, saw a digitizing system sitting under a dust cover, asked what it was, and everyone was afraid of it in the shop. And I uh, was allowed the time after work on my own time to uh, learn how to use the thing myself. And I just had to figure that out. Once I did that, worked in the industry for quite a long time, won a few digitizing contests, and through that was able to start blogging for the industry, writing for the industry, and eventually teaching. So that's that's kind of the the career arc. I was an in-house digitizer doing a lot of custom work out here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, ended up eventually doing a lot of stuff for film and TV, as well as business to business, police, military, the regular stuff that you would assume everybody does. Um, after that, 
worked for Deco Network for a while. So I've done a lot of e-commerce. I actually did e-commerce kind of throughout this time, uh, running individual stuff for companies. Uh, worked at Deco. So got to kind of experience the software side there and then moved on to work with Embrilliance, helping them kind of uh, work out what's going on with commercial users on their platform and a lot of other just stuff that we did with the software. So helping to develop features and test and work on things and uh-huh. make assets. So still digitizing up to and including five minutes ago. <laughs> I was going to say, and digitizing probably right now. Literally digitizing right before we started. Yeah. <laughs> so on a post today, there was a uh, posted a question on posting any questions if you're not going to be available tonight or just just in, questions in general that we can feel tonight. One tongue in cheek question from Frank Dunn was what makes us experts since we label ourselves experts for this episode. And I think I think what it is, is between the five of us, we have probably 100 years of of experience and knowledge in the industry. So if one of us doesn't know it. Hopefully the other four has the answer. So I think that's <laughs> that's why we bring this panel together that, you know, I'm not claiming I'm an expert at every single thing, every aspect of the industry. But when you group, get a group together like this, I, I think you're going to find somewhat of a, of a correct answer that you're looking for. Well, Absolutely. Though I want to say this. Anybody who says they are the guru, the expert, they have nothing left to learn. You're done. Don't Don't be in this industry. There's always something else to learn. There's always something new to figure out. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. All right. I'm going to run down some uh, comments. So we have Baby Jean here. I'll be listening on the TV again to the program. No questions or comments till after. Uh, good evening. We have Kingsbury Crafts. Hello, everyone. I'll be in listen uh, mode as well. We have Marcy watching from Eastbrook, Wyoming. We have Barb LaFond watching from Central Minnesota. Suzanne Hale. Hey, on, uh, on time for once. We have Bob watching from South Carolina. Hello. Stephanie from Baltimore, Maryland. Alexander from New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm going to break right here. If you guys have questions, drop them in the chat. We'll pull them up. Uh, This is a complete question and answer forum. So feel free to ask all your questions. Uh, We have Frank who's going to ask the really hard questions that I'm going to give to Justin first every time. (laughs) (laughs) Because... I, I told Frank I would ahead of time. Uh, we have Suzanne here from yep, Rope, uh, Newport, Rhode Island. We have Letty from Ohio. And we have Christine saying, hey, guys, four AG instructors and Eric. We'd love to have Eric at AG if that was possible. <laughs> I, mean, I can't. I'm not committing on Eric. Did you just like put me on the spot right then and there? Yeah, just she, yeah she put you on blast right there. <laughs> I, I'm feeling that. I, I feel attacked. all right well one of the questions that we got in the facebook group um that was before the show was at what point does extended effort in to perfect pathing carefully planned trims tweaking all stitch angles etc become not worth it uh is it as simple as one-off design just to get the minimum or every design gets fine-tuned must be a law of diminished returns where technical perfection only serves to satisfy the digitizer or operator and adds no real value to the customer slash job. That sounds like Mike. Yeah. <laughs> it it was from Mike Muldowney. Did I, I not preface it. that? I should have no. prefaced that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't who wants to start? Because I, I definitely have ideas on that one. I don't know. That's uh, Dude, I'll let you Dude. start, Eric. Go for it. For me, the reason why I'm so focused on that stuff is, and I'm sure DJ is on the same boat, when you do this stuff commercially where you may do thousands or tens of thousands of imprints of the same piece, the returns are in inefficiency. So you're going to be doing that repeatedly. And the thing is, for me, I never knew in a business business sense. I mean, we had ideas about who was a client who'd be keep coming back over and over again, but you don't know when Joe's Plumbing gets the city contract and suddenly you're doing 10 pieces for them every two days. And you're doing that for 10 years. Um, if that continues on forever, uh, you you gain that efficiency. Now, I still agree that there is a diminishing return. If you have a true one-off piece and it's a couple of trims, it's an extra color change that you need because you have one garment that needs a specialty color, then I can imagine doing it in a less efficient way. But if you really expect you're going to be doing tens of thousands of pieces or even hundreds of pieces on this design, uh, how many of those minutes do you want to lose to extra trims or spoilage or anything else? I mean, that's that's the difference for me. But here's where I'm going to c- call myself out. I was super overworking a font about 15 minutes ago. 
<laughs> so when there's stuff that you're going to have other people look at the working file and reuse it and scale it, then sometimes the pixel perfection gets more important because they're going to abuse the file. They're going to do whatever they want with that file and size and scale and shape it. But there are still times where you're like, do I need absolute perfect positioning of every node, absolute perfect Bezier curve? We, when you're in these like sub thread width measurements, no, it, of course not. Of course not. That's just for us. You're right. It, it, Mike's got it. It's the digitizer just wanting that. Well, I think part of it too is like you said, whether I think most of our backgrounds are, you know, high volume and industrial yeah. industrial work. So of course our thinking right off the bat is what's the best case scenario for our production. Yeah. Um, if, if you do have these these hobbyists or, or smaller companies that may say like, oh, I'm just doing a here, piece here and there, uh, like you said, it, their hobby may turn into a business next year. And if they have this library of designs that, that they've done that they're just getting done to get done, now they're going to have to go back and digitize it themselves. I've, I've had several times where customers said, I have this file from five years ago. It's awful. Can you just redo it? And so if you if you start from the beginning and you, and you I guess you do it right from the beginning uh, in mind of production, then it's tenfold going to get to give you that 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 quality and that efficiency every time you run it. So. DJ, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that I'm really, really big on um, efficiency um, and I like to keep the needle moving at all times, the problems that we experience are when we um, trim, uh, do color changes. Those are the times where we have our issues at a machine. And I'm really, really big on planning. I find that I think that most people, um, they'll just open up software and start digitizing design without looking at it and saying, OK, how am I going to path my way through this? Yeah. What's the best case scenario? And what you find is if you take that time um, at the beginning, you'll get a really clear plan going and you'll find that you, not only will you digitize it way faster and the reason you'll digitize the design faster is because you're not going to go back and try to make some edits. Um, that's what usually takes longer than anything else is editing or tweaking a design. So if you take a little bit of time at the beginning and you just plan your design out and look for ways that you can keep the needle moving, um, hiding other stitches, um, just that little prep, it makes a huge difference and i'm always going to every design i do i'm going to do it as efficient as possible and it doesn't matter who it's for if it's for me for somebody else if they're going to only stitch it one time um i find that um if you do that all the time it's quick it's fast and you're doing it right and it doesn't take extra time to do it it, and it's, it becomes second nature when yeah. you're doing it over and over again. It's it's natural. And, and just just like you're saying, as far as planning, I, I approach it exactly the same way you're describing it. And it annoys me sometimes where I'll be in the middle of a design and then I catch myself and be like, I, I didn't plan that right. And I have to kind of <laughs> back up, rearrange, you know, my thought process in the, in the digitizing. But yeah, it's actually annoying to me. It's like, I didn't plan this right. I got I to gotta start over here. Well, I think the difference is so you can always modify it. Um, you yeah. get the general plan going, and then you do find things you need to tweak along the way. But just having that plan is, yeah. uh, I think, key. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, the, the huge difference is when you start going back and you're tweaking things like if you're using Bezier mo you know, model editing, you're just going back and like you're altering handles and you're tweaking little tiny micro movements. You're just reshaping curves, making sure every line is perfectly straight. You can start to feel when you get to that diminishing return. Because yeah. there is this point at which you're putting, you've put in about 85% of the effort, you know, everything's good, it's going well, and then you double that effort. Like suddenly you're taking the same amount of time in the tweaking stage as you did in the entirety of the digitizing stage. I feel like you get a feeling for that over time. Mm -hmm. There comes a point when you're done. though, I, And I'll admit, there are some designs that I've gone, even though it's, it's done for efficiency, if I'm doing one piece that has dates on it for a bridal piece, it's very, very unlikely I'm going to redo it. If I have to make an alteration that adds one trim, I might. Now, I mean, most of the time, I won't be able to make myself do it like that. <laughs> but I can imagine doing that and not be feeling too terribly bad about it. But that's a that's a, a unique case. That's not logo work. That's definitely not kind of business-to-business -business production work. And honestly, I would never do that for stock. 
that's the big one stock or anything that anyone else is going to touch i want that thing to be as close to ideal as i can get it just because i know that that's somebody's going to be using that and using it in different ways that i expect I mean, i'm sitting here counting in my mind how many times i thought thank god i only have to do x number of this yeah <laughs> it's really on the machine. <laughs> That's a whole different thing. If you're already on the machine and it's showing problems <laughs> and you have two more pieces, then <laughs> then then we might talk about when we do the edit. <laughs> so we have Suzanne who says, I have done hundreds, maybe thousands of a design for a great customer for several years. Today, I decided it should be reduced test. Yeah. yeah but, we, we actually had a, a design on, on the machine today that uh, I think it predated me working with this particular company. And I was just watching it run as I was walking by towards the end of the day, I was watching it run part of the design. I'm like, I got to redo that. It's, it's holding, it's holding a production. These hats should have been done by now. Yeah. And, and yeah, I noticed it's like, yeah, that has to be redone. All right. Well, here's another one. And this one has to do with thread. It was actually asked in the group last night. Um, and I'm really interested on your guys' take of it, but does anyone use Ray on thread? I'm very, very small uh, compared to all of you minister talking about business, I'm guessing, um, mainly does table linens, but somehow I think the rayon thread looks better. Is it possible that I'm missing something? So we're going to go into the rayon versus polyester debate. <laughs> so I'll, I'll start like, uh, you know, where I worked, um, we had both rayon and polyester thread and rayon, uh, as most people know, that was what most people used and they're, you know, is a lot of advantages of rayon, um, but with machines getting faster, that's where it's kind of uh, hit the dead end in a way. And that's why polyester is so much more um, popular. But rayon, the nice thing about rayon is it relaxes. So yeah. when you stitch it out, it just kind of relaxes on the fabric. And I do, personally, I feel like it is a little bit prettier of a thread. Um, I think that satin stitches, especially longer satin stitches and things like that are pretty amazing with rayon thread, but I use polyester and I do that because I run a machine that I do a thousand to 1200 stitches per minute, you know? So mm -hmm. it's kind of one of those things where I love it, but I don't use it. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally in the same boat on this one. Um, I started out entirely on rayon. First shop that I worked in ran all rayon all the time, all Madeira rayons. Um, and I still, some of my favorite threads ever have been rayon for the look. However, when you're doing business to business and you expect any kind of laundry to happen, especially if you ever have like uniform style laundry going on, you do anything for medical then you're going to need it because it's not going to hold up to chlorine bleach. It's not going to hold up to industrial laundry in the same way. And it doesn't even hold up to abrasion in the same way as polyester. But absolutely, when you're talking about the tensions and the spring back, the lash, rayon's, rayon runs nicer. It does, especially at like the lower, at lower speeds, like you say. But the polyester is just a little more bomb proof. Um, I would love to run it. And honestly, uh, you said the person asking a question is doing table linens. If you're putting good laundry instructions in on it, it's not something you expect to be bleached repeatedly. I can see, yeah, home decor is a great place for rayon to still to still be used. Um, I just I wouldn't ever put it in a mixed you know in a mixed area where you're going to have laundry. And this is how I'm going to tell you I know because uh, my operators at one point uh, realized they were running out of a red thread while we were working on uh, lab coats for a large medical place. So we're, we're doing hospitals, a chain of hospitals, and they've started mixing in cones of rayon. And you can imagine when all the pink lab coats came back next week mm -hmm. about how happy I was. Um, laundry does not work the same. You have to include instructions and be very careful about mixing cones or uh, who's in your shop not paying attention to numbers. <laughs> but they got that job done that week. Oh yeah, they stitched it out real nice. <laughs> got the repeat come back. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a repeat when it's a free order. <laughs> that's, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> and if you're planning on running 3D foam, stick to polyester. Yeah, yeah, ran, ran. It's not gonna not gonna be your friend. You know, I ran uh, Madeira's that reflective thread that they have mm -hmm. on 3D puff, and it very much ran like a rayon. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, anything that doesn't hold up to abrasion, you probably don't want that much density running on top of. I will say that, though, if you watch somebody's design that has too much detail in small areas in rayon, uh, it tells you really quickly where there's too much detail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, here's a question we have. How do I get customers to understand that their website doesn't need to be on a hat? Uh, I hate embroidering at all because it's so small. <laughs> Justin, I'm going to throw you under the bus first. Um, right off the bat, when customers bring me new designs that, you know, a new customer or a customer bringing me a new design as far as the embroidery side of things, um, I think I, I have the benefit of, of being a digitizer as well. So when someone brings in a design, I can explain to them right away the limitations. You know, you only have two and a quarter to two and a half inches to work with on a hat, depending on the hat style. Um, and, and just, just to kind of explain to them, okay, you know, if you're trying to jam in this billboards worth of information on, on your hats, um, especially when they're getting in addition to printed t-shirts or embroidered bullet shirts, something where they can do a sleeve or something if they, if they're insistent on having their website. Um, but just explaining to them, you know, trying to jam that much information on, on the hat that, nine times out of ten someone's it's going to be so small that even if you were to pull it off uh in embroidery it's not going to be readable and, you know it's not going to be legible for someone to actually recognize oh that's the website i need to go to for this for this particular company so um just explaining and again you can upsell to to someone saying like if you're looking for something that's a little bit more billboard ish uh print some t-shirts have it in the back something that's bigger that someone can easily read um mix and match you know just emblems of designs on hats since you're looking with a smaller area more information on the left chest maybe more even more information on screen printed uh, shirts uh but just just explain to them what they're up against and and i'd say nine times out of ten people you know you being the professional in, in your industry they're going to listen to to your uh your insight and your suggestions um but yeah just i guess I, the way i spin it is i want them to have the best possible uh design on their garments and i'm gonna i'm gonna give them the the uh the notes that i think need to be done to to achieve that for them all right dj oh i don't really have anything to have i think you get it I <laughs> it's uh it's difficult i mean it is it's it's difficult to do but um sometimes you just have to sit there and explain it as to the reasons why they might not want to do that so because it's not going to look as good when you get too much detail right oh, yeah honestly i have two things that i arm people with on this one because i teach this in classes all the time uh number one the handshake distance uh, there was a study done like in the 60s about the American handshake, and it's about three to four feet away from someone that you are bodily when you're having you're doing a handshake. If someone can't read something at that distance, the likelihood is they're not going to be able to remember it or see it. It's not legible anyway. So I tell people, judge the design from at least three to four feet. And in the last few years, it's been the social distance. If you can't see it from six feet, maybe you can't read it. Uh, if something can't be legible from a distance, there's no point. And then the next thing I do is I, I in classes, I invariably tell everybody when we're talking <laughs> about small lettering, I'm like, all right, everyone raise your hand. If you've copied a website or a phone number off somebody's hat and when nobody raises their hand, I'm like, all right, well then that's why we don't put phone numbers and stuff like that. That doesn't mean we don't do small text. Cause the other thing I have co fairly consistently when I was doing work for the hospitals, sometimes they had to have their department. It was, mandated by the hospital or legally mandated that they had to say where they came from or had their department or some other information had to be on their apparel. And when that happens, no matter if it's a little too small to read, no matter if it makes sense, they had to have that on their apparel. The other thing I had at one point was people who had licensure numbers and they had to represent themselves with a licensure number, whether it made sense or not. For those things, it's about the, it's just about what the, the client needs and you do your best and you work with the, the, the technical way of handling it like we talked about earlier. And then I give them the other the other dumb thing to tell them, which is they can have anything they can write with a brand new crayon. Because the end of a brand new crayon is right about one to one point two mils wide, so with forty weight threads, you can probably make that happen. There but, you go. Uh, <laughs> I try to make it as easy to understand as possible because I have a tendency to over explain stuff. And when I watch somebody's eyes glaze over, I'm like, okay, here's the here's the two sentence version of the thing I was about to do to you. 
<laughs> let me let me try to explain this in a way that doesn't put you to sleep. <laughs> we actually uh, we were licensed for the U of A, the college mm -hmm. here in town, and they actually um, when they went through a, a new process of of licensing and, and getting approvals on designs. Uh, they have a site where we can we can access all the the lockups of all the departments and everything. Mm. And they actually went to they gave us a version specifically for embroidery now because they actually learned mm. that that line of lettering that they want on the left chest that's got like thirty letters on it across the top. You know the College of Agricultural. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> they they understood that that's not going to work, and because so we were fighting with them so many years saying. You're telling us these are the only approved layouts. We can't achieve that in a left chest. And they actually came up with that. It was actually pretty cool that they uh, they give an alternate alternate, and they actually call it an embroidery alternate. So that's now my favorite place to work for ever. We all love you now. <laughs> Your favorite <laughs> school. <laughs> oh, and also, I see it. There's a comment about people wanting the www. My gosh. Just make them type their website in without the prefix and without the rest of the stuff and tell them it actually works. That drives me nuts. I'm just like, I swear all modern browsers will bring you to that website. I swear. If, it, if you find one person for whom that doesn't work, <laughs> I'll give you back the shirts for free. <laughs> wow. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a minute since the triple W was necessary, folks. <laughs> so I have a question. I think it would be more directed towards uh, Justin or Eric, because I know you two have definitely had retail fronts. I don't know about you, DJ. Mm -hmm. Um but like, let's say a customer walks in and they have a design that they want to put on their hat with the full www dot, I, whatever. But yeah, you know, we don't want to do that. And a lot of other retail places, especially smaller mom and pops, are doing like crafty things. They'll have like their twenty six uh, fonts that you can pick from, and they'll have them all embroidered out. Would you recommend doing something where you have a hat, let's say, with a design that is horrendous? which is pretty much exactly what they're asking for. Their logo, their website, Bob on the corner, and then phone number on the back or whatever, and then have one with just their logo. Um, and you can be like, this is kind of what you're looking for, it sounds like, but look at this one, it's a lot better. It's gonna draw people's attention and try to persuade them that simpler is better. Would you recommend right. doing that? You're on, Eric. Okay, I'll go. I'll say this much. I had a, I made posters. I made posters for our shop. We had a wide format printer and I had posters with good and bad embroidery on them with, that looked like, I mean, they looked kind of like propaganda posters or like posters for uh, kids learning how to wash their hands where you got a big red X on the thing that wasn't good. I made posters like that that did essentially what you're saying. We're so I, 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 I have to see if I have anything. I don't think I have anything left. I wish I did now. But we did one of those and part of it was the handshake distance thing. I had a I had tape on the floor and a design on the wall and I had people stand away from it and we could also clip their art to the wall at size. So when you have a location where you're literally you have a showroom, you can do something like grab the hat they're holding, grab something that they're looking at. I, I never did the bad example like you're talking about, which I think is awesome. That's fun. I would love to do a cluttered version versus a nice clean version with the logo. That's great. But we would clip their design and have them literally walk the three feet back and say, all right. How visible is this now? Are you still happy with what you got out of it? And we would even do that with our uh, previews and our stitch outs too, because sometimes we'd have people grab a stitch out and do the classic thing that the users do. <laughs> they're the people who come in, they come in and look at the stitch out and they're, you know, they've got their jewelers loop out and they're looking at everything. And I'm like, all right, let me see that real quick. Clip it to the wall, stand at three feet. Are you still happy with it? It's not an excuse for bad quality, but there are certainly people who are absolutely nattering after little tiny quality blips that are not going to be visible from any distance on apparel, you know? So yes and no, <laughs> but yes, I'm guilty of doing the, uh, you know, <laughs> this is the good version. This is the bad version. And particularly for hats. And mostly it was about um, vertical layouts versus horizontal layouts on hats. Logos that are extremely vertical, that have text underneath a vertical narrow object and uh, invariably you have some design that's like a, a person or a figure that's very vertical, fully standing up. By the time you're down to the size of the hat, the vertical limit that we have, you've got like the person the size of like three matchsticks wide. It just never looks great. So we would show people the difference of the layouts pretty, pretty reasonably. And we did have one of those little books with all the stitched out fonts too, admittedly. That is, I mean, we do, we have a showroom that has samples of, of, of garments and 
And of course, all our hats are are the good looking hats that we like the designs and <laughs> that are impressive. Um, but yeah, that is a good idea to maybe come up with something that's got teeny tiny website lettering on it or have something all over it. And it's a good visual to say, you know, you're looking for something like this or you look for something that's a little bit more clean, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. And that's when you upsell them on a puff design of their their tow truck with a wrecked car exactly. in the back or roto router. There you go. All right. So I have a question and I'm going to I'm going to throw it out there for you guys. So um, I've seen a lot of debate when it comes to selling hats. A lot of people say, you know, bottom up, center out. And there's also a, a school of thought out there that's top down, center out. Um, which one would you guys do uh, and kind of why? So I'll, I'll start with you, DJ. The best results that I ever got always was bottom up center out and you just get a little bit less of the the hat shifting and moving it's easier to get a, a nice line especially along the bottom when you kind of focus from the bottom center um, just kind of flattens the hat out a little bit nicer registrations a little bit better um so that's that's what i do mm -hmm. Bottom up, center out all right eric pretty much the same i mean i have never had to you know i've never tried to go top down i'm just going to admit it i've never bothered with that because once i got the right <laughs> the right results out of bottom up center out i never really tried to do much else i'll admit that sometimes you have designs where it doesn't work that well to start in the bottom of the design or it doesn't have it's got split text at the bottom or something else where you're kind of like not in the center quite or when you're working off center, it, but the thing is when you're working off center, everybody goes, oh, but you're not really in the center of the hat. I'm like, it's not the center of the hat, it's the center of the design mass because you're pushing that, that wave of fabric out from the center. The one thing I will fully admit is I've seen people manage to run single color stuff with no registration, even left to right sometimes when they're like a line of text and they then they'll stop and go, this is proof that you guys would lie into us about <laughs> starting from the center out. And I'm like, it doesn't have to register. Uh, I've taken a design that wasn't redone for hats. And as long as it was roughly okay with where all the directions were going in the pathing, a central design, single color that has no registration, not a ton of stitching is less likely to cause problems. It doesn't mean that you don't need it. When you start having multiple colors and the hats shifting all over, or you have a really stiff buckram, something that's going to really wave or flag. If you have any kind of off contact from the needle plate, if it's too far above that needle plate or you get up into the bubble in the crown, that's when that stuff matters the most. The funny thing is that just not all hats are, are going to be quite as bad off and not all designs are going to co cause the same amount of shifting depending on kind of the path and the overall, you know, move, the apparent movement of the needle. It can change a little bit. So like I said, there's ever, there's always somebody in a class who will gotcha me with like, I have, a, I have this particular frame and it's grabbed on the front panels and I did this design or they do the other thing, which is stick it down they'll stick the hat down to stabilizer and it, adhere it and glue it down. And I'm like, okay, but in production, in a production capacity where I want to do these things quickly and jam them onto the hat frame and move them through, I'm going to try and reduce the amount of shifting from the design. It's like the, the extra time spent on the design is worth it to me. But I know that part of that argument is if I don't digitize and I can't do this, I don't want to pay to redigitize some stock element to be on a hat. And I totally get that. But this is once again economies of scale too. Yeah, I mean, you got everybody needs to remember when we're when we're when we're teaching these these theories, we're we're giving you the best case scenario that works the majority of the time. Yeah. There's always going to be those those few cases that uh, the the design is going to dictate that we have to change it up a little bit. We're going to try to yeah. keep it close as possible to that to that theory, but there is times we're going to keep it. And the way I've always looked at it is when 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 I started. Because admittedly, when I first was digitizing, I digitized the logo by the size to fit it on a hat. I, I didn't yeah. really follow. I wasn't taught that theory of bottom up, center out. And and I remember there was times where I would see issues in, in production. Um, but you got to remember, like DJ was saying, starting with with the, the, the area that's not only is it, it's more secure when it's closer to yeah. the bill because it's sewn yeah. to the bill. Uh, you're, you're hoping is going to be more secure in that area. So you're you're gonna work you're gonna work with the foundation that's a lot more stable right here from yeah. the get go. You're not gonna start at this bubble at the top of this crown, which the majority of problems that people have with hats 
is when you start hitting that that bubble area on on structured hats. So you, you're kind of starting that foundation where you know you're you're kind of the best area of 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 um, you know you're hooping and in, in, in the and in the flatness of the hat, and then you're working your way up. So. Well, it's the same with designs, right? It's the same with rippling. And I'm sure you probably, everybody's seen this with like performance wear. If you work toward a piece that's already stitched down, you can make a bubble or a ripple happen as we push loose material around. If you start from the top in a crown on a, on a hat that does have that kind of bubble structure where it doesn't want to lift up and you go toward the bill, I've got a feeling you're going to see a little bit more of that loose material wind to shift. I mean, it, but it's going to be dependent on the, on the hat too. Okay. I mean, in short, bottom up, sit around. <laughs> I, the only time I've ever not done that is when I have like a really big, let, let's say an oval that's going to be filled and then text underneath it. And I nail down and go from that oval first. But it, it really kind of depends on the design when people are putting, giving that stuff to you. Are you going to go this way, that way? Or, you know, I my first run of hats I ever did, it started on one side and came up and went over the seam. And I was fighting the wave the whole time it crashed over and stitched, you know, a wave in the front of the hat, which I didn't think was possible at the time because it's pretty stiff. Um, and that happens to be the same order that I sewed a hat to my finger trying to push that wave out. And so I will never forget that if you go from this side to that side, you're going to get a wave because <laughs> everybody in the emergency, um, emergency room wanted to come in and see the guy with a hat sewn to his finger. And I, I, I don't ever want to experience experience that again. That makes me want to do the, the morbid poll. Who's sewn their finger yet? Everybody raise your hand if you put the needle through your finger. I have, uh, I have scratched no. my finger with the needle <laughs> and bled a lot. I did not uh, through my needle or finger. According to my x-ray, I still have a piece of needle in my finger. Wow. <laughs> oh. Never did it. I, I have chipped the fingernail. That is close as I've gotten. I felt it coming though. I was, was that close. It was on a <laughs> it was on an old Melko single head that didn't have a uh, a sensor on it. So yeah. Yep. And see when uh, I look at machines, I'm like, can we take that safety sensor off? <laughs> but then, you know, I sewed my finger to a hat, so I don't need the safety <laughs> sensor. <laughs> By the way, I didn't get the memo that I was supposed to wear a hat tonight. <laughs> yeah it's a lot of plagues there for me it's the lack of hair that that makes that happen this, yeah. this is the nerd row <laughs> I, mean, say, I, I don't have hair up at the top and it just doesn't grow so i i wear a hat 90 percent of the time yeah for that reason so i got one for you i it's it it seems like whether it's you know from from my dealing with customers or or watching questions in these various groups and whatnot that we're that we're in um it seems like you have these trends of of the same question coming up quite a bit and i'm in this trend of having people having issues with performance fabrics so i wanted to get your guys insight in how much of uh you know barring a certain logo may need certain specific things uh but how much of it is if if you are doing the the proper things and, and want to get your opinion on what the proper things are as far as uh digitizing adjustments uh how much do you, of it do you think is is on the digitizing side and on the embroiderer side as far as stabilizer and, and whatnot i'll let dj go he, he, got, he <laughs> talked about the about stabilizer, stabilizer. <laughs> i think it's the combination so i think um the design could be not digitized properly for performance wear and if it's not then you're going to experience issues but what i find more than anything is probably the stabilization and um, making sure that that fabric is not going to be moving around um, keeping it nice and um, taut and so but i do feel that there is a you really have to be careful with the design um, because the more that you're going to be moving around going all sorts of different directions, the more puckering you're going to get. And so you really do have to work that the fabric, you know, you kind of have to like 
kind of push it in the direction you want to go. You don't want to get too many things coming into each other, um, going in too many different directions. So you do have to pay attention to the digitizing, but I think the the stabilizing is is really part of the key as well. And unfortunately, when it comes to performance, where we don't want to see that stabilizer on the back, mm-hmm. and that's where the issue really comes in, is because most people want that mesh stabilizer um, because they don't want it to be shadowing. And so Mm -hmm. it's just, it's not as uh, stable. No, totally. What do you think, Gary? Uh, well, I think that it, once again, it is holistic. I, I know I use the, the 50 cent words when I start talking about this stuff, but it, it has to be all, all of the above for me or it's not ideal, but you can kind of lean in different directions. If you're stuck with a design that's not perfect, but you can afford to add more stabilization as far as stabilizers, sometimes you can swing it a little one direction or the other, but you're never going to get the ideal combination of like... Uh, non rippled surface with a nice hand so the garment flows we don't get the credit card the bulletproof shield problem and have the design have nice coverage unless all of the things are put together correctly it has to be hooped right hooped taut but not overstretched so there's no lash or rebound when you unhoop it absolutely uh correct stabilizer that's going to be actually dimensionally stable that's the thing people will try and use washaways or tearaways and i'm like the life of this garment that's not going to look great yeah. Like you still need something that's going to be present down the road to make this look good. But I will fully admit that I've digitized lots of special versions of stuff for the extremely light, extremely stretchy materials. I did a lot of work for gyms for a while. And during that period of time, it was when no one would touch anything with any cotton in it at all. Everything was moisture wicking. Everything was polyester, very thin, very stretchy. And that's where I started using what I call the tablecloth method, which is honestly digitizing it more like a hat than a flat which is where I would move from the center out. I would try and stitch, like I said, apparent motion of the needle. We all know it's the fabric moving, not the needle, but the apparent motion of the needle is away from existing stitch materials. Um, sometimes using a little bit of a spray adhesive, light embroidery spray adhesive and adhering the backing when I was really having trouble with, with the design. Um, and like I said, center out as much as I can away from existing areas if I'm not going center out and occasionally using small uh, global underlays that stitch down the material first. Yeah, um, and I was going to say that too, because I, yeah. I like that you brought that out. Center out is a little mm-hmm. bit more what I do. But the other thing that I find that helps for me anyway um, is I will use a little bit more underlay yeah. on those um, garments. And I'll try to use a little bit more underlay and a little bit lighter of top stitch density. Yes. Yeah. And totally. I find that that really helps quite a bit as well. And the global underlay is a great point. Um, you know, anything, hats, um, yeah. anything mm-hmm. that you really want to control, um, that global underlay really works well. It, it's kind of shocking. I've had designs that wouldn't run where I didn't change the densities. I didn't change anything else. And I added global underlay just to stitch things down to the stabilizer, or you know, literally just to marry the stabilizer and the garment completely. Use it like a sewing machine. And then the design's okay. It's not perfect. You want to have the lighter densities for sure, but I've been surprised how many times I can get away with a design that's okay if I can stitch it down and make sure that we've got a complete adhesion of that material to the uh, you know to the stabilizer underneath. Now, like I said, spray little spray adhesive sometimes is good too, but that's a, a lot of process. If I can achieve something similar all on the machine with no stoppage, that's pretty great. I don't want to do more material additions if I don't have to. But I will fully admit to having garments that were so cantankerous that I just finally said, yeah, we're going to glue this sucker down. We're going to spray a little tack around. We're going to set up a booth and make sure this stuff is really adhered to the backing. That um, brings up a whole other topic is the spray adhesives. Have any of you used uh, water-soluble stabilizer? Yeah. Get it wet and spray that on and let it kind of work as your adhesive. Oh, that's cool. I mean, I've used spray, I've used uh, water soluble adhes, you know, adhesion on stabilizers, but I never thought about using it as, as a sta- as an adhesion kind of layer. Um, that's cool. Very light tack, but it doesn't gum anything up. It's not, you know, just like so. It's that's little, interesting. Yeah, 
I, I've not heard that before. So you just like dissolve it in a spray bottle and with some water and go, huh? Wow. I know what I'm doing wow. after this. I told you, everybody, there's something to learn every time. So DJ now wins wins Everyone, the pool for, for getting everybody. Water probably makes a lot better as well, right? Or topping. Yeah. yeah. Makes a ball out of it. Yeah. You have to dab your embroidery stitches to get all the centers out. See, I always oh, did wow. the I did the cigarette method. We oh, would leave yeah. leave the sheet on, right? Leave the sheet on, and then we'd have a jiffy steamer work from the bottom up with the jiffy steamer and actually physically roll the uh, the salvy topping up the top. And yes, it rolls up a little uh, cigarette as you go, and it stays sticky and it tears all the centers out in one go. Yep. That's so yeah, um, we we always have the always. the salvy balls. They yeah. start growing. They start they growing and they start rolling those around. Yeah. Every time I see somebody either complaining that they're washing or picking out with tweezers, I'm like, oh, you poor thing. Somebody who did not stop and talk to you about this. This is that is, this is not hard. <laughs> it shouldn't be. Um, Though I will say, have a steamer, I wanna, everybody. I want to point out, too, about the um, going back to the, the shirts and performance wear. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize um, that with the mesh stabilizer, if you put it in a star shape, so like you take it and you make it kind of form a star, it can quadruple the amount of stitches that it can hold. So if you really want to like kind of um, get more bang for your buck, if you want, if you will be, if you really want to make sure that it's uh, you got the proper stabilization, making a star shape with mesh stabilizer is a really good thing to do. Yeah, yeah, they they have angles where it's not as dimensionally stable and it offsets those angles. So yeah, absolutely. If you're using the performance kind of woven mesh stuff, you have to just offset that angle. It it really does make a huge difference. Right. Absolutely. Totally. You're you're just saying do it like this instead. Yeah. Like just for a demonstration right. since I had it close. I can't even instead of like this where it looks pretty. <laughs> like that. Besides, you should well, be cutting think, uh, your a lot of a, a lot of people, you know, that that are especially that are using the 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 hooping stations that have the the magnet that holds the the back. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times it's it's kind of a pain, um, but the I think it's the hoop master that we have. I've noticed that you could actually when you turn that other one into that diamond shape, they actually will slide up in between the the uh, magnets on those those holders. So mm. it may take a little bit a little bit more time when you're actually on there, but. The benefits of, of the way it stabilizes it's definitely huge. worth it. Yeah. That was a super good point. Mm -hmm. All right. I think uh got one more question here. Uh, okay. So this is one that pops up in a lot of groups, actually, quite frequently, um, mainly for um, people who get this question where their clients are asking for the files, uh, like the actual test files. So it's, do you give your clients the digitized files um, if you charge them the digitizing fee because they're paying for the service? And is it considered legally theirs? In my opinion, I don't think so. Because if you go to a manufacturing plant and you're getting plastic molded stuff made, you can't just ask for the mold when you're done with your run. You have to buy it. So that's my opinion. What do you guys think? Well, so for me, I, if they asked for it, I'd give it to them. And that's just how I always was. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. But one of the things that you can always do, I wish that more people really focused in this area was the customer service side of things. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the finishing of your embroidery. A lot of people will take a design and they'll go somewhere else. But if you do a lot of the little things and you do it really well and you make sure that... Um, you know, everything comes out really good. They're going to come back to you anyway. So yeah. I don't get as worried about that. I find that if you're doing your job and you're really making sure that you put out a good quality product and a lot of that comes down to the right stabilizer, all that kind of stuff, just the packaging of yeah. it, all of those things, you do it right. They're going to come back to you if they do venture off and try somebody else because I we all know there's a lot of people that just really don't care. Yep. No. Yeah. yeah. It, it, the way the way we look at it is is we don't offer it right off the bat if they pay for it if they ask for it. Yeah, we'll give them the file. Um, 
we'll give them the DST file. Um, but it is it's there's two reasons why they're asking. They're not happy with your service or your quality. And if 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 they're not your you know your right customer or they're not working well with you, so be it. Take your business elsewhere. Or there's there, there's sometimes where if they are thinking ahead, you know, I, I my company, I uh, an old company I worked at burned down, lost a lot of files. So, you know, if they're if they're thinking smart, hey, now they have a copy for themselves that not only can they take it somewhere else, but if, you know, if that company has a, a fire and they could always bring it back to that same company and say, hey, I have my file. So here you go. Yeah. Or or even just like something, a, a special situation where they're they're going to I need to take this file and have it done somewhere else locally on a, on a pinch or anything like that. And, and as far as I'm concerned, it's just customer service to make sure that your customer is getting what they need. So if they yeah. want to take that file and get it done somewhere else, you know, at this particular time, well, they're going to eventually come back to you because you're willing to work with them that way. Yeah. And honestly, I, I feel the same way about getting away the file. Uh, not because it's something that's some sort of legal obligation, but because I try to think about what I'm actually trying to achieve. Um, how many of us love vendor lock-in? When somebody tries to say, yeah, you can't repair your own stuff you own or you can't. Nobody loves that. Nobody loves right. being kind of strong armed and staying with a company. It's not a good feeling. I don't want my customers to have that feeling about what I do. Um, once again, I, I would say we didn't offer our files most of the time. When someone asked about this, there were a couple different ways we would handle it. Number one, if you ask for the file, you can absolutely get the file. But it is at the DST. No other information. The sequence, the colors, everything else is going to be figured out by your new company. They can take time because honestly, we don't know if they carry the same thread colors we do anyway. And I hate to say it, this is what you get for free. For free, you get the DST file. Right. The other company can handle all the rest of the figuring it out on their machines, on their thread sets, whatever it is. But we also did offer a package where if you wanted a hard copy of the sequence with everything included, one of your stitch outs, the file in a hard copy in a nice little folder that was part of something you could put in a branding package, we would produce that as a product that we sold. So we would sell a product that was essentially a branding guide for embroidery. So we can then offer that to corporate clients. And especially because there were certain corporate clients that had to have a local copy. One of the stipulations was, if you're going to have this in our budget, and I think, actually I think it wasn't corporate clients, it was government clients that did this the most, we have to have all assets that you produce have to come back in house and be on our, on our systems in our building. Whatever you buy, we have to have it. And it was part of the stipulation of them buying it and us getting the PO. We could then just say, all right, for the amount of trouble that's going to be for us, great. We are going to do that. But the only way we do that is we offer this branding package in which you get all of these other things. We get enough money to make sense of it for us. And we print up a little document and throw a stitch out in there so that you have everything you need. So you can spin that into a product if you want to. At least that's another option. And then I'll say the other, this is the not nice version. The not nice version I have is for people who are completely... Uh, focused on bargain shopping, I would sometimes hand this over after something that was, you know, we had one of those fights and say, in six months, when the shop that's doing it for half what we're doing it for is out of business, we would love to have your business again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yes, I said that for real, not a lot, not frequently, on occasion. And yes, we had customers come back in whatever number of months, because a lot of the times they were bargain hunting for people who were just cutting their own throats for the job. And uh, honestly, when somebody's doing that, I mean, I said the nice, not the not nice version because it's funny. Most of the times we just very nicely handed them a file and said, if things change down the road, we'd love to have your business again. Why burn the bridge? If they're going to leave, they're determined to leave, stopping and telling them, no, you can't have your file. No, I'm not handing this to you. Why would I do that? Making a fight, talking about legal rights to the file just means they're less likely to want to come back to you anyway. And you might make a person that is actually advocating to other people not to use you they're going to go out and tell 10 other people how you were a jerk right. when they when they left why right. make somebody who's actively interested in telling everybody how they had a bad experience with you right. i don't i don't feel it's bad for people who decide to keep the files that's not a problem i don't think there's necessarily it's not like a moral imperative to give the files away but i always had to think for myself unless there was something we spent time developing and we weren't making money at it. And that's the thing too. If you're not charging for your digitizing and somebody is left before the job is done, a whole different ball game. But when it's something that's no longer about development, if it's not something that you develop something new, it's not something that you haven't been paid for. Once you're paid, better option by far is just to say, Hey, here it is. We'd like to keep having your business. 
even if they're leaving, say, what is it that would have made you want to stay with us? Why not ask them and see if they'll say something. And if nothing else, just don't burn bridges. Don't, don't right. get the negative review for no reason. And if it, if it is a case that, like you said, it's a totally different yeah. story that if you don't charge digitizing from the get go, yeah. whether you're absorbing that cost from, from paying an outside digitizer sure. or you're doing it in house, it's probably a good idea that you upfront tell them, I don't charge setups, but if you want a copy of your design, it'll be X amount. And that's and just something so that, so they know right from the beginning. By the way, make that profitable. That's not, you don't have to just make that the cost of what you pay for digitizing. If you want to be upfront about it and say, here's what I want. Because right. the other thing people don't think about, as an embroiderer, you're communicating with the digitizer and helping this person to get the best result. That's labor. That's labor you're doing to make sure things turn out well. Um, it's worthwhile to go ahead and say, for that communication, and you don't necessarily have to tell your customer this, but for that communication, I want this markup on handling that file until they decide to take it. That's not, you know, there's nothing saying you can't do that. Right. Um, but certainly, I, I will say the couple of times that I haven't released a file, it was more about like we were doing brand development for somebody. We made something really special and we're not even through with the process yet. And even though they wanted to pay and get out, it was like, all right, we've done all this this development work that is far more than what we've gotten paid for. You're either going to have to you know pay for this package or we're just not going to release the file. There were times like that, but it was always one of those cases where with good intentions, you're developing something with somebody and it turns out that it doesn't work out sometimes that can be a reason where you say, all right, I made you this brand new, excellent thing, or I did something different from other people with the embroidery that I don't especially just want you to take out and take the development costs and have me fund those for you. But it's a rare case. That's a super rare case. I mean, I've, I've recently come across this and um, it, to me, I just, I give them the file. I, when I started, I wouldn't, but, but now, you know, I realized that if I gave my customer a file and they went to your shop, Eric, and they handed you that DST file and said, here's the file I got from the other place, would you run that on your computer? Or I mean, on your machine? That, that's the flip side. When people come to us and they have their own DST, I, I pretty much, if, 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 they, if they say that we know this is a good file, we've used it before, my caveat is we're going to run it as is. I can't control the quality of this design. I, I would suggest that you pay us for the setup fee and you're going to get exactly what you need and the quality that you're looking for. And I, I, and I can control that, but yeah, if they bring it into us, that's, that's kind of the flip side. If we're the other guys that someone's bringing their file from, um, if, if they're leaving a place because they don't like the quality, well, that very well, very well may be the, the problem is, is, is the, the digitizing. So we're not going to want to use that file anyway. So. Yeah, no, I don't think I've yeah. really spoke about what I'm doing. So I gave an example of what I thought about the legal part um, based on Facebook. But I, like Jeff, never gave up my files. I still typically don't just because I digitize it in-house. And for my process of how I make patches, uh, whether I'm using a laser or marrow, and I don't know what they're going to be using, and I don't really want to play tech support for that. So I typically just don't release them unless if, uh, like, one of my clients requested a patch or the file for a patch design. He's getting into making patches. So it's like, well, he already has software. I can give him the file and he can figure it out. And like cases like that, there's just, I just don't really want to be that tech support for a file if you're not yeah. going to use me. But well, would, I mean, wouldn't you guys agree that a lot of it's just, uh, it's about communication up front? I mean, yeah. I think that's a lot of it. It's just about communication up front. You, you have to be clear about what you're willing to do and not willing to do, no matter who's where you're releasing a file to whoever. Plus, I'm going to say on Matt's account, because I see a lot of stuff you make, people give you napkin sketches. The amount of development you're doing on a file is not the same as just digitizing from clean art that someone hands you. They're giving you like hamburger and you're, you're making steak back out of it. Or um, that's all. Yeah, that's, that's a whole different matter. I'm not saying that we all don't as digitizers, but... You seem uniquely to have a lot of those. And I think that that's development. I feel like that's development work that should probably be paid for maybe a little higher than just, that's design work. It's not just digitizing work. They are two things. Um, not that we don't all do some of it. Yeah, that's my onboarding uh, client requirement is that it must either be on a PowerPoint or, <laughs> a, and, or a dry erase board is also allowed to, or a picture of a dry erase board 
that's been sketched onto a napkin because you can't bring a camera into your work center. <laughs> I've done that too. My favorite is a um, picture of vinyl, so, like from an off angle on the back of my truck. That's always the best. That's a uh, great shot. You know, I don't know. Yeah, you can, you can throw in that good. door, the glass door. Yeah, the glass door is absolutely one of those. Yeah. <laughs> and and their note in their notation, not the truck. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, you mean you don't want me to create the truck that you're only showing me the quarter panel of? That's that's for when you send it to someone overseas and they do the whole truck and the logo yeah. for five dollars for one hour. <laughs> sure, that's what we so, should do from now on. Is just throw it all through auto digitizing when someone does that. The door, the truck, whatever, the whole picture every time. Well, if you guys <laughs> haven't seen, and uh, I know in the Discord group I posted it. There's a, the meme that I created where it's uh, it originally was like, this is Bob. It's snowing outside. Uh, he doesn't go on Facebook telling you it's snowing. I changed it. So it said, this is Bob. He's a digitizer. He doesn't solicit and whatever. I got one in an email saying, we want to digitize for you. I'm like, that's cool. Here's this image. And I sent them that image. And they're like, cool. We'll get it for you. And then they digitized the entire uh, meme and emailed it back saying payment is ready. And I <laughs> sent them a payment request on PayPal, sent me the design. I laughed. They actually did digitize it. And it's like, you guys had to have obviously read the meme <laughs> to make it. Oh my gosh. That is one of my favorite things is when someone says, I'm a digitizer. I work with a commercial company. I'd really like to do the, uh, all of your service for you. And uh, my reply lately has been same. <laughs> same. I even said. same same that's good so be, before we go mike will be very angry if i don't ask this question so i'm going to just post it in the comments right now because of course mike our nerd from the north territory uh wanted to throw out something that was a mind bender so i'm gonna go ahead and post it here and you guys can later on uh <laughs> i think you broke it did i break it probably so the question so, is yep. yes the question is he's he's going to uh, in a true dst the universal accepted max length is 12.1 millimeters max and i went back and forth with him saying are you asking before it triggers a, a trim code or, or, yeah, or what, what yeah. are you asking exactly here, Mike? And so he's explained to me that's that's only in the X and Y directions is this length. <laughs> and this is dating back to the old shift lead machines and, and their movement. <laughs> so he's saying if you take that measurement and you go across every axis and now you're going into like 45 degree angles, which is going to be your longest point. What now is your geometric value? of your longest length. So we're not going to get into that here. Oh, you know but... what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to throw it back and say, because I've had to handle this a bunch working in software, I'm sure DJ knows this too. Did you guys know that different machines may have different settings for the maximum length stitch they are willing to stitch from well, out of the gate? That's what <laughs> my kind of, my first thing was, is like, well, you could actually go in and tell a software yeah. and tell a machine that it's only going to do a certain length. Um, but I, I guess... And I also threw out there, I'm like, Mike, why are you even trying? You're, you're, you're not even you're factoring the kachunk of your machine. Yeah, man. <laughs> Seriously, that's going to be a slow double cycle. Why do you want to do that? Right. But <laughs> I, I, yeah. If you guys want to go back to the comments later, and if you want to add anything for Mike to satisfy his, <laughs> his <laughs> engineering brain uh, question, then. Here's what I'll say for everybody who ever asks people for software help and they start in with their machine. Do you know how many machines there are, folks? There's a lot of machines out there with a lot of different settings in them. We don't know every single one. You know what we do? We Google your manual. That's what yeah. we do. <laughs> so please Google your own manual first, and then we can look at it together. <laughs> there you go. Now, is it user manual or technician manual? Oh. Whichever one talks about the problem you have. <laughs> Which, whichever one Google pulls up first. <laughs> yep. Right. Oh man. All right. Well, guys, that takes us. We're officially five minutes over. Uh, it's not bonus time till fifteen minutes. I, I've determined that, but we're, we're five <laughs> minutes over. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, I'll start with you, DJ. DJ, where can uh, people find out more information about you? 
Um, I guess my website, the digitizingmasterclass.com. Um, not the digitizing, but digitizingmasterclass.com. Um, on Facebook, um, digitizing for dummies is one. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's probably the best place. All right, Eric, you're up. Uh, yeah, go to ericcampbell.com. If you want to watch the take up on Fridays, 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time, that's where I do my live show. So ericcampbell.com up at the top of the take up tab is a good place to be. Um, and honestly, you'll find me um, most everywhere else from that. But uh, you'll find me doing my live class. The last live class of the year right now is scheduled for Fort Worth Impressions Expo. So I'll be out there if you want to come see me talk about patches and stuff like that. Otherwise, take up is a good place. And anywhere you want to look on social media, believe me, if you search Eric Campbell with that little funny H at the end of my name, I will show up. And uh, I can be summoned, albeit uh, a little bit later than you probably want me to be. <laughs> All right. And Justin? Uh, jadigitizing.com is where you can find me, um, at jadigitizing on all the popular social medias. Uh, but you can't tag angry. him. You can't tag my Facebook. <laughs> no, according to Facebook, <laughs> I, I go against the uh, community standards, I guess, even though I've been on there for 20 some years. It's Anyways. all those super saucy designs you're making. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, 3D Puff Pro yeah. Tools .com for the for the 3D Puff tool. Um, all three of us and DJ will be teaching at HE in uh, Applicate getaway in July in Texas. So you can find us there. Um, other than that, hanging out in the embroidery nerd group and the Discord group. All right, Matt, you're up. All right, and I'm Matt Enderly. Uh, I have patchphrase.com, nine inquisitive patches. That's all I do. I don't do hats um, or shirts or jackets <laughs> or packs or shoes or anything other than patches. Um, that's it, Jeff. Don't don't forget at Patch Phrase. I said that at oh. it's patchphrase.com. Everything is at Patch Phrase. So Facebook Patch Phrase, Instagram Patch oh. Phrase. <laughs> can, uh, can we tag uh, it? Uh, tag it. I don't have one of them. Um, <laughs> Pinterest, uh, Snapchat, not Patch Phrase. Don't have one. Uh, <laughs> more likely they're not a pat phrase all LinkedIn. right well i'm jeff. i'm jeff fuller and you can find me at fuller embroidery works and the embroidery nerd um definitely over in the embroidery nerd facebook group and the discord channel which is a lot of fun so um i know matt has something pulled up here i think he wants to show it yep so uh we mentioned a couple of links both uh for dj and eric uh below um, we also put a link in the chat, uh, which is links.embnerd.com. If you happen to go there, you're going to see this lovely screen. If my computer comes up, it's being really slow lately. Uh, you're going to see here, uh, as um, Justin mentioned, applicate getaway. That doesn't even look like it's spelled right, but uh, it is. It's good. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, it's way too late in the day. Um, but yeah, you can go there, you can register. Uh, we got a couple of links, but all the way at the bottom, we have the two links for the two guest uh, speakers, presenter, whatever you want to call it. The two guests on the show um, <laughs> and plan this out. But uh, you can go ahead, follow us on any of these other lovely links. And uh, back to you, Jeff. All right. Um, so uh, there we go. That is DJ Anderson from Digitizing Masterclass. We have Eric Campbell from The Take Up, Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios, Matt Enderly from Patchphrase, and I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works. We are all here representing the Embroidery Nerd, and we'd like to thank you guys for hanging out with us, and uh, we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody.